Can you maybe just talk about, you know, when new technologies are kind of coming through or new ideas, approaches, how you as a group or you as an individual say, uh, I want to do it. I don't want to do it. I think it's worthwhile. It seems challenging. The capital equipment requests are nutty. How does that all work in, in your real life? It's a great question. And it's been, um, like I said, part of this whole movement within big community practice to try and improve cancer care. There's just fundamental differences, right, between hospital-based uh, organizations and groups like mine. So completely independent group. <clears throat> We're not affiliated with the hospital. We're, you know, thankfully, uh, we, we are still independent, you know, amongst all this integration that's going on in urology. We're completely independent. So to your point, we have various structures and, and we have you know, committees, the governing board. But ultimately, if, if, if there's a new technology that's interesting and that moves a needle for our patients, you know, there's a chance there's usually a champion physician that kind of brings it to a higher level. And then we talk about it. But, you know, one of the bigger differences is we do focus on the finances, the economics. It has to it has to at least be a net neutral for us. Otherwise, it's very difficult to sustain. And so it's one of these things that in the bigger picture of this, and, and this is one thing that I've been kind of preaching for a while. A lot of my partners are tired of hearing me say this is we can't look at the line item, you know, every single thing that we do, if this, if it makes money or not. And obviously that's not the right way to do it. As we're seeing such an explosion, like you said, of cancer care, diagnostics, treatments, you know, imaging, all things that are coming. What we have to realize is, is that sometimes you're going to have to bring something in that may not be very cost effective, but it's going to enhance the, the everything else, right? It's, it's going to be indirect uh, revenue, indirect profit, improvement in inpatient care, and that is going to drive downstream visibility of your program and visibility of the overall service line. So, yeah, I mean, we have, you know, kind of a P&T committee or, or, or whatever that, that people come to and say, hey, this is what I'm interested in bringing in. And then we talk a little bit about the finances, but there are some things that unfortunately just will never be able to move the needle. Um, blue light cystoscopy is a very interesting example. In the community, blue light cystoscopy, it's obviously extremely valuable. I've been a champion of blue light cystoscopy for a long time. We own our own surgery center. It's kind of attached to our main building, but there is no code, as you know, there's no different reimbursement code for doing blue light cystoscopy or doing a TRBT blue light. So what that means is, is you're making the same amount of revenue that you would if you didn't have the technology. And the technology is quite expensive, right? There is a, a tower, a special set of scopes, and then you have to buy and bill for the actual agent, which you put in the bladder. So the finances of that, if there's no increased compensation or reimbursement, are very difficult. And it's not that we say, well, we're not going to do it. We just say, well, let's work with the hospital, right? Um, and and so that's kind of how we do it. We've been doing flexible blue light in the office, which has been really great. But very recently, there have been some now new challenges to that as well, because there's the scope support for flexible scopes has become uh, more difficult. So I would say it's an interesting lesson for a lot of younger urologists who are, you know, kind of thinking about things and, and how to get things done. And it's a little bit difficult. It's a little bit more complicated to just bring stuff in in big community practice. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And like I said, there's things that we lose money on all the time, right? MRI is the perfect example. MRI fusion biopsies for a long time, right? Doesn't You don't get anything more for doing an MRI fusion biopsy. It's the same thing as doing a regular biopsy, but we all realize that it's better for our patients. And there's a lot of clinical improvement that we see in prostate cancer from it. So we've adopted it, but but we have to be careful in the community because again, we have to keep the lights on, number one. Number two, we have to be cost effective and we have to try to promote value uh, in what we're doing and just buying all of the latest, greatest new gadgets sometimes doesn't work. Yeah. Well, this topic's fascinating to me and, you know, it's, it's MRI is just, and I'm going to stop talking about this because I do find it to be fascinating. You know, if you if you become less familiar with MRIs and you don't do MRI fusion biopsies, you're already kind of one step, in my opinion, kind of starting to get behind the eight ball. Right. And then right. like new things come in. You'd mentioned Danny Ramirez, awesome guy doing a gazillion transperineal biopsies. Now you add in like a whole new technology, a whole new approach. And 
it seems like you get one step removed and next thing you wake up one today, you're like, oh my God, what the heck hack? And I'm, I'm practicing, you know, a relatively obsolete brand like a of dinosaur. medicine. Yeah, absolutely. 